That might be the highlight of the worship service. We'll open up for Q&A in a moment, Greg. <laughs> we'll set the choir relax a little bit, give them time to catch their breath. In the meantime, before the Q&A, if you will, look on the back of your order of service at our scripture this morning. It comes from Mark's Gospel. As we travel through Mark's Gospel the last few weeks, I invite you, if you're able to stand, to stand for the reading of the Gospel. Mark chapter 6, begin with verse 14. It's from the message. <clears throat> King Herod heard all of this. For by this time, the name of Jesus was on everyone's lips. He said, this has to be John the baptizer come back from the dead. That's why he's able to work miracles. Others said, no, it's Elijah. Others said, he's a prophet, just like one of the old time prophets. But Herod wouldn't budge. It's John, sure enough, I cut off his head and now he's back alive. Herod was the one who had ordered the arrest of John, put him in chains and sent him to prison at the nagging of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had provoked Herod by naming his relationship with Herodias adultery. Herodias, smoldering with hate, wanted to kill him, but didn't dare because Herod was in awe of John. Convinced that he was a holy man, he gave him special treatment. Whenever he listened to him, he was miserable with guilt and yet couldn't stay away. Something in John kept pulling him back. But a pretentious day arrived when Herod threw a birthday party, inviting all the brass and the blue bloods in Galilee. Herodias' daughter entered the banquet hall and danced for the guest. She dazzled Herod and the guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me anything. I'll give you anything you want. Carried away, he kept on, I swear, I'll split my kingdom with you if you say so. She went back to her mother and said, Hmm, what should I ask for? Ask for the head of John the baptizer. Excited, I don't get that. Excited, she ran back to the king and said, I want the head of John the baptizer served up on a platter right now, and I want it now. That sobered the king up fast. But unwilling to lose face with his guest, he caved in and let her have her wish. The king sent the executioner off to prison with the orders to bring back John's head. He went, cut off John's head, brought it back on a platter, and presented it to the girl who gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard this, they came and got the body and gave it a decent burial. The gospel of our Lord for the people of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So, something really cool happened to me this week. My wife went out of town. <laughs> no, wait a minute. That's just distrustful. No, my wife went with her sister to see her aunt, her mom's sister that lives out in... Texas, but Leanne and I had to get a new car because I made a bad financial decision of signing a loan for my son to get a note, and it just didn't work out, so we ended up trading that truck and a car to get my wife a new Rogue. It has Sirius XM, deep tracks, classic vinyl. Oh, my God, I'm in heaven. No outlaw country. So... The first song I hear Thursday as I get in her vehicle, because she's out of town and I can drive it, is Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Deja Vu. I don't know if you can hear it, but just the beginning of it, they start, yeah, there you go. And the line goes, if I'd ever been here before, I'd probably know just what to do, don't you? The execution of John the Baptist was one of many acts of extreme violence attributed to Herod Antipas. He was actually the Roman puppet king of Galilee. 
And there would appear to be much legend as fact to the story of Herod's rash promise to his lover's daughter, Herodias. Now you have to understand where Mark's coming from. His, his is the first gospel. So he's the pioneer. But he remembers things as he's writing. And he begins this particular story by talking about the king's guilt and his fear that Jesus and his disciples would start another rebellion similar to what John had started earlier. The idea that Jesus was John raised from the dead was popular among the common folk back during that time. So this story plays a large part in Mark's narrative because it reflected the king's guilt and his fear and the fact that it led people to believe that maybe John the Baptist really had been Elijah and now Jesus is reincarnated as John. Walter Rink wrote an article about John the Baptist in this particular passage. He makes a strong argument that John's movement was absorbed in the post-Easter church, that Mark consistently portrayed John as Elijah resurrected by linking the suffering of Elijah, the execution of John, and the crucifixion of Jesus Mark succeeds in saying that John's suffering is not meaningless. And Mark writes this to comfort the Roman Christians who are undergoing unbelievable persecution at the time that Mark writes this letter. So Mark attempted to encourage the Romans and sort of avoid the attention of the Roman officials. So as a prelude to the Passion narrative, the story of John's imprisonment an execution set before the church, a promise to end suffering and humiliation. My question for us today, is this not a passage for us that calls for justice in the face of entrenched political and economic power? We've got to stand up. So now back to the fun part of the story. So Mark begins this particular passage by saying, and everybody was becoming aware of Jesus' actions. And some were thinking he was John come back to life. So what happens now is then Mark begins to say, okay, this is what Herod did before Jesus was coming to life. And he tells this story. So let's, let's kind of review it real quick. Herod's the ruler of the region. While vacationing in Rome, he gets the hots for his brother's wife. Happens every day. John the Baptist then suggests that maybe it's not okay. Now, Herod likes John as much as you can like a crazy locust honey-eating prophet who lives outdoors and speaks often of consistently inconvenient truths. Truths like, you know what? It's really not okay that you're sleeping with your brother's wife. Yeah. I think that's what John said too. Which in the truth is what got him arrested to begin with. It also got him on the merciless side of Herodias. She didn't like John. Then Herod throws the party. The big birthday party and his daughter-in-law Salome dances for him and the other drunk generals and CEOs and celebrities who were there, we don't know the exact nature of her dance. Herod, enough, was pleased by it that he offered at least half of his kingdom. I'm not sure what dance she danced, but I'm sure it wasn't the waltz. As I've looked and studied this passage this week, I continue to think that our world really hasn't changed a whole lot. Those in power or those seeking control will do whatever they can to keep or achieve their supremacy. People will still divorce someone because they fall in love with someone else. The details of this story are horrific, but they aren't removed from us as much as we might think. What Herod did was wicked. There's no reducing it. But maybe besides being a scoundrel, 
Maybe he's also kind of a tragic character because he knew better. He knew better. How often do we get caught up in the spur of a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we make promises to somebody, promises that we know we really don't need to be making, much less are we able to keep. And somebody else ends up paying the price. This story reminds me a lot about David, especially with Bathsheba. You know, I've always wondered, if she had been taking a shower, would she be shower Sheba instead of Bathsheba? It was worth a try. But think about it. He goes, I didn't mean to get you choked up, babe. He goes, not only takes the wife, but kills her husband, and then says, when he hears the story repeated back to him, he said, oh, I'll go take care of that. And he said, that person is you. That person is you. And David realized his sin. Why didn't Herod just say, look, I was just kidding. I'm not going to give you the head of John the Baptist. You can have whatever else, but you're not going to get that. I kept thinking all week long how many times I have been Herod to somebody. How many times I have taken my authority, my power, what little it is, and inflicted it for poor use upon somebody else. One of my favorite theologians these days is a a female tattooed Episcopal priest named Nadia Bolds Weber. And she writes about this particular passage. She says, there is no good news in this story. I looked for it. But maybe that might actually be the point. Maybe we're supposed to notice that this is the only story in Mark's gospel where Jesus isn't the central figure. There is no Jesus. So if this story stood alone... There would only be sedition and sin and violence and bondage and political maneuvering and incest. The only thing that makes this story good, Weber writes, is that it's not the end of the story. I don't know about you, but I haven't been able to see movies like I used to go to. I don't know why that is. I just thought I'd throw that out. But a friend of mine told me they saw the movie The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. And as I thought about what that person said about the show, she was asking me and telling me something about a particular character. And I remembered this week when she said, there's a character that says, they have a saying in India that goes like this, if all is not well, it is not the end yet. We're all travelers, we're all pilgrims on a journey, and it's not the end yet. And I think how we treat other people, especially when we are in positions of authority and power, tells a lot about the Christ that lives inside of us. The greatest human quest is to know what one must do in order to become a human being. Emmanuel Kent. The greatest human quest is to know what one must do in order to become a human being. I think Jesus said it this way. To love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how you become fully human. Thanks be to God.